2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. The Apostle Paul emphasizes that while we exist in physical bodies, our battles are not merely physical. Our weapons are not of worldly origin, but derive their power from God, capable of demolishing strongholds. These strongholds refer to fortified structures that provide protection or advantage, whether in the context of the Lord as a refuge for the righteous or the darker strongholds that grant the devil sway over individuals. These demonic strongholds are seldom discussed within the church, yet they are undeniably real. Personally, I've grappled with them, and it's likely you have too. The insidious nature of these strongholds lies in their propensity to grow unchecked, much like the relentless expansion of roots in soil. Consider the analogy of roots. Just as roots delve deep into the ground and intertwine, so do these strongholds entrench themselves in the lives of individuals. One stronghold often begets another in a vicious cycle. Take, for instance, the initial struggle with lust, which may evolve into the stronghold of pornography consumption. From there, the descent into actual fornication may occur, fueled by a lack of self-discipline. Years pass, and the stronghold of fornication deepens its grip, eventually morphing into adultery, even after marriage. Contrary to popular belief, marriage does not inherently grant self-control. Instead, the stronghold of adultery begets further deception, as the individual resorts to lies to conceal their infidelity, fabricating stories about their whereabouts, companions, and communications. In essence, these strongholds form a tangled web of sin and deception, enslaving individuals and hindering their spiritual growth. Recognizing and addressing these strongholds is paramount for believers, as they undermine our ability to live obediently to Christ's teachings. Through God's power and the guidance of Scripture, we can dismantle these strongholds and reclaim victory over the influence of evil forces in our lives. Do you see how one stronghold can lead to another? From lust to pornography, from pornography to fornication, from fornication to adultery, and finally to lies and deception. Hebrews 9.27 says, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. We all are born with an internal moral compass, which is the human conscience. You know right from wrong. Even if you haven't read the Bible, you know killing someone is wrong. Even if you have never read the Bible, you know that stealing is wrong. Fundamentally, even without having a Bible or knowing the Word of God, people know that some things are wrong. Now, one thing you need to be careful about is searing your conscience. The Bible tells us that it is very possible to have seared conscience. And this is one of the greatest warnings. Once you have a seared conscience, you are in trouble. A lot of people don't know what searing is. Searing is a technique used in grilling, baking, braising, roasting, sauteing, etc., in which the surface of the food, usually meat, poultry, or fish, is cooked at a high temperature until a browned crust forms. You can sear roast beef in a pan. Fresh hamburger is seared when it's put on the grill. Whatever is seared is burnt and is not the same as it was before. And so it is with the conscience. 1 Timothy 4 verses 1 through 2 says, The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars, whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Most people think of hardened criminals, felons, and most deranged people as having seared conscience. But I believe so many people who are listening to me now, who attend church, who call themselves Christians, have a seared conscience, or are in very real danger of experiencing this spiritual phenomenon. And one of the ways that sears your conscience like nothing else is pornography. When you sin, have you ever felt guilty when you did something you know was wrong? I'm sure that all of us have at some point in our life. 
we did something wrong, we committed a specific sin, and felt guilty that we did something wrong. Although it is an unpleasant feeling, it's good that you have this because it shows you have a conscience and that your conscience is still intact. But if you keep doing that same sin over and over and over again, the sense of guilt begins to go. You no longer feel that godly sorrow. You become numb to it. And this happens with watching indecent things on the internet. The first few times you do it, you are so upset with yourself and you're not happy with yourself because you know it's wrong. But after a while, you begin to accept it and it begins to become normal. You begin to accept the sin and live in it and wallow in it. That same sin that used to bother you does not bother you anymore. That is what the Bible is referring to as a seared conscience. A conscience that is no longer sensitive to sin. A conscience that is indifferent to sin. This is what happens in the spirit realm when you watch porn. It begins to sear your conscience. It begins to kill your conscience. In other words, if we suppress the conviction of the Spirit of God and resist Him and keep on sinning, after a time, the conscience is so seared or burnt that we cannot hear the Spirit speak to our conscience anymore. This is not just in the area of sexual immorality. People can sear their consciences in so many different ways. If someone lies a lot, their conscience to lying becomes seared. There are people who are capable of doing unimaginable things, but have no remorse whatsoever. In summation, if a person remains in sin long enough, he or she can reach a point where he or she is no longer influenced by the Holy Spirit. He or she has become so hardened that he or she will not listen and does not want to hear. This is the worst place for a Christian to be. When you are a Christian, and you are able to practice sin and it does not bother you, and you feel no conviction of sin, you are in a dangerous place. If the Holy Spirit can no longer convict you or chasten you, are you still a Christian? The more a person suppresses, ignores the voice of the Spirit, the harder it is for the Spirit of God to speak to them about their sin. If this continues, the conscience will become like a callus on a hand. It will not feel anything anymore. By tuning out the Spirit of God, we are making it harder each time for the Spirit of God to speak to us. In essence, brothers and sisters, pornography will put up a wall between you and God. One stronghold serves as a gateway to others, gradually entangling individuals in a web of sin and deceit. Acknowledging our imperfections is crucial. As 1 John 1.10 reminds us, Claiming to be without sin is self-deception. Therefore, it's vital to honestly assess our lives. This doesn't necessarily mean publicly declaring our struggles, but rather privately acknowledging them and bringing them before God. Salvation hinges on our relationship with God, not on external factors like our relationships with others or our reputation within our community. Therefore, it's essential to approach God directly, seeking His help in overcoming the strongholds in our lives. We shouldn't tolerate or protect these strongholds, as they only serve the interests of the devil, Ephesians 4, 17, 18 reads. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Ephesians 4, 17, 18 underscores the importance of spiritual understanding, which illuminates the workings of Satan in our lives. The devil thrives where ignorance prevails, establishing strongholds in areas where understanding is lacking. Contrary to popular belief, it's not solely God's responsibility to resist the devil in our lives. James 4, 7 instructs us to submit to God and actively resist the devil who will then flee from us. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Taking responsibility for resisting the devil's influence is crucial in safeguarding various aspects of our lives, including our marriages, businesses, ministries, health, and overall well-being. Take accountability. You must submit yourself to God and actively resist the devil. This passage emphasizes that God won't resist the devil on your behalf, 
it's your responsibility to resist him. As warriors for Christ, it's up to us to tear down spiritual strongholds and engage in the spiritual battles on earth, utilizing the weapons God has provided us. The devil most easily establishes his stronghold in a life consumed by sin. Anyone who has grappled with addictions, such as masturbation, smoking, drinking, fornication, stealing, lying, and other sins, understands the power of sin as a formidable stronghold. Sin captivates individuals, hindering their ability to live righteously. Hebrews 12.1 urges us to cast aside these burdensome sins and run our race with patience. Each of us has our own besetting sin and it's essential to recognize and acknowledge it. The devil exploits these weaknesses to construct strongholds of addiction in our lives. However, there are no physical remedies to destroy these spiritual strongholds. This is why the Bible asserts that our weapons are not of the flesh, but empowered by God for demolishing strongholds. If you find yourself ensnared by a stronghold of sin, struggling to break free, relying solely on physical strength or resolutions, will not suffice. Instead, turn to Christ, who will supply you with the strength needed to secure victory. Ephesians 6.10 admonishes us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Therefore, let us be strong in the Lord rather than relying on our own willpower, intellect, or mental resilience. Our strength lies in surrendering to him and allowing his power to work through us to overcome the strongholds in our lives. Strongholds aren't exclusively tied to sin, but can also stem from entrenched negative mindsets that develop over time. These mindsets encompass ideologies, opinions, and philosophies incongruent with the truth of God's word. Satan exploits these ideologies to hinder us from accessing the full blessings God intends for our lives. Indeed, a believer's spiritual growth is often limited by the quality of their mindset. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 5 instructs us to dismantle satanic strongholds by rejecting imaginations and lofty ideas that contradict the knowledge of God. We are to bring every thought into submission to Christ. Our thoughts and imaginations originate from our mindsets, and failure to align them with God's truth can result in our minds becoming strongholds for the devil. He manipulates our misconceptions to work against us, robbing us of the abundant life God promises. Ephesians 6:12-13 clarifies that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of evil. To withstand these forces, we must don the complete armor of God. Equipped with this divine provision, we can dismantle the strongholds of darkness. It's imperative not to create an environment conducive to the devil's operations. Instead, allow the word of God to shape your ideology, reject ignorance, flee from sin, and then you'll be empowered to resist the devil. Relying on God is paramount in our journey of overcoming strongholds in our lives. Human efforts alone are insufficient to break free from the grip of strongholds. We need the supernatural power and intervention of God to bring about lasting transformation and freedom. First and foremost, relying on God entails surrendering our will and control to Him. Often, we try to overcome strongholds through our own strength and strategies, only to find ourselves frustrated and defeated. However, when we relinquish control and trust in God's sovereignty, we open the door for His miraculous work in our lives. Proverbs 3-5-6 reminds us to trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not on our own understanding, acknowledging Him in all our ways so that He can direct our paths. Secondly, relying on God involves seeking His guidance and wisdom. In our own limited understanding, we may struggle to discern the root causes of our strongholds or the most effective strategies for overcoming them. However, God sees the bigger picture and knows the intricacies of our hearts and minds. Therefore, we must seek His wisdom through prayer asking Him to reveal to us the hidden areas of bondage and to guide us in the steps we need to take toward freedom. James 1.5 assures us that if we lack wisdom, we can ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to us. Thirdly, relying on God means trusting in His power to break every chain. No stronghold is too entrenched or too powerful for God to overcome. His power is made perfect in our weakness, See Corinthians 12, 9. And he is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Ephesians 3, 20. Therefore, even when we feel overwhelmed by the magnitude of our struggles, 
we can have confidence that God is greater than any stronghold we face. Psalm 18, 2 declares, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Finally, relying on God involves persevering in faith and prayer. Overcoming strongholds is often a process that requires patience and persistence. There may be times when we feel discouraged or tempted to give up, but we must continue to trust in God's promises and to pray fervently for His intervention. Galatians 6.9 encourages us not to grow weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up.